بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنجم إذا هوى ما ضل صاحبكم وما والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد باب من عال ثلاث أخوات عن ابي سعيد الخضري رضي الله عنه ان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يكون لاحد ثلاث بنات او ثلاث اخوات فيحسن اليهن الا دخل الجنه continuing with al-adab al-mufrad by imam bukhari rahimahu allah the chapter is about taking care of three sisters the hadith is rated on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever has three daughters or three sisters and he takes good care of them illa dakhal al-jannah most certainly that person will go to jannah in the previous chapter, we talked about the virtue of taking care of daughters. In this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in addition to daughters, he mentioned the sisters also. And this is also very important for us to remember. Sometimes people consider their sisters to be burden on them. And in many cases, people don't take care of their sisters. That is not my daughter, it's not my responsibility, it's dad's responsibility. And if dad is not there, generally they get lost. No one is there to take care of them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, a person who would take care of three daughters or three sisters, he shows kindness towards them. He is taking good care of them. Illa dakhal al-jannah. Surely that person will go to Jannah. So such a great reward. You can't mention a higher reward than Dakhar al Jannah. This has to be the highest reward. Which is, of course, at the same time, is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. Dakhar al Jannah means that person will go to Jannah, will go to Jannah only if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with the person. The next chapter is about taking care of one's daughter who is divorced. An Musa ibn Ali an Abi radiyallahu anhu anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqala li suraqat ibn Jushim أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَىٰ أَعْظَمِ الصَّدَقَةِ أَوْ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ الصَّدَقَةِ قَالَ بَلَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said to Suraqah ibn Malik ibn Ja'shim رضي الله عنه that should I inform you of the most important charity or he said one of the most important forms of charities he said, surely Ya Rasulullah, tell me what is that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ibnatuka mardudatun ilayk, laysa laha kasibun ghayruk. Your daughter that comes back to you, which means after being divorced, she has no one to provide for her other than yourself. Which means she's dependent on you. If you don't take care of her, she is lost. She has no one to take care of her. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when you take care of your daughter that was divorced, she came back to you and you take good care of her at that time, this is one of the highest form of charities a person can give in this world. Amazing. It's your own daughter. You're supposed to take care of her. Even if there was no reward, you're supposed to take care of her. It's your daughter. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioning such a high reward for this. Considering this, to be the highest form of sadaqah a person can pay. Of course, we know the reward of sadaqah is something there is no limit to it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us a small piece of grain will be as big of, uh, as a mountain. This is a normal sadaqah. Imagine when you get to the higher forms of sadaqah. And here you are getting to one of the highest forms of sadaqah. Few things that we need to notice in the light of this hadith. One is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us the importance of our daughters and the importance of taking care of our daughters. And especially once the daughter was married and you thought you fulfilled your responsibility, most of the time at that situation, parents relax. And they say, you know, our responsibilities are over. Now, they have their own future plans. Based on now, we, are, we have done whatever we needed to do. Our responsibilities are over. We married all of our children. They got their education. Now, we are going to relax. And all of a sudden, one of the daughters comes back to you. And she's divorced. In this situation, Generally, this family, be it parents, brothers, sisters, and other relatives, they consider her to be a burden on them. Why did she come back? In today's time, what many people do is, and we don't realize, maybe unknowingly, it's just a train that we got into, we don't see what we are doing. People train their daughters in such a way that if you ever get divorced, you be independent. A lot of people who are giving their daughters higher education, when you ask them, why are you doing this? If they have a good reason other than this, that's that may be good but generally the answer is what if she get divorced in simple words you are preparing your daughter from this age to think about getting independent after a certain age so when she gets independent then she even tells her husband that i don't need you There is an age after which a woman feels that if I'm independent, my children are grown up, financially I'm strong, and especially if the husband is not as strong as her, then generally they don't need their husband. Something that we need to understand. That husband needs the wife. The wife doesn't need the husband. So, in the early stages of the life, they both needed each other. So, they were working together. Now, when you come to the stage when one of the two doesn't need the other, then the whole lifestyle changes. The format of the life changes. And this is when most of the people start getting into difficult life situation. Because... It's understood that I don't need you. So anytime I don't like anything that you're doing, I'm leaving. I'm on my own. In fact, 
I think even I'm leaving, it's an old statement that I just picked it up from the history maybe. Nowadays, I'm going to kick you out. I'll make sure you can't come close to this house anymore. And you won't be able to come close to your children anymore. This is when they are independent. So when one of the two parties is totally independent, doesn't need the other one, this is what happens. And of course, it could work from both sides. If the men feel well, that I don't need my wife anymore, of course, it's going to create a situation in the house. Same thing when the wife feels I don't need my husband anymore. So creating that mentality from the younger age, from the early age, that you know your education is mainly so that when you grow up, you don't need your husband anymore. This is not a good mentality. This is not a good way of raising our daughters to think that way. The other thing that happens is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this hadith said لَيْسَ لَهَا كَاسِبٌ غَيْرًا She has no one that would take care of her other than you. Which means if the daughter is divorced then father, if her parents are there they should take care of her uh, this responsibility. They should take care of her. Same thing if there are brothers, parents are not there, they can't take care of her, then brothers are supposed to take care of her. So if brothers and parents are there, they are responsible. If they are not there, then the next person that will be closer in kinship, people who would inherit their father, if say father was alive and he passed away and he had no sons, who will inherit? out of men, that man will be responsible to take care of this girl and be it a daughter or a sister. This is how Sharia distributes the responsibility. But now what happens is she will try to take the asset of her husband. That because of him I got into this situation, so now he has to pay for it. And for the rest of my life, he's going to keep on paying for it. Every country has different laws. Every country have different rules. Some of them have similar, but they have different details to the rules. Regardless of what country of the world the person is living, whichever country we are living in, we have to remember that for a believer, we must adhere to the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person uses any system to take away people's wealth without their willingness and Sharia does not allow it, yes, from the worldly point of view, legally you may be able to take something but you will have to return it on the day of Qiyamah. It's not yours. There are different ways of pressuring people, of forcing people. A person is walking on the street, approached by a robber, at a gunpoint, he takes 100,000 away from him. Another person, he goes through some system where Someone is misusing the system and he's able to take 100,000. Same, same thing. The judge that is sitting up there, he doesn't know the situation. He has to judge according to the witnesses, according to the situation that he's hearing, and according to the books in front of him. But remember, haram is haram. And a day will come. But every person will have to pay back whatever he or she has taken against the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When looking at this hadith, and especially Suraqa ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, this is a name 
that I can't pass this name without quickly reminding of who this Sahabi is. Most probably, those who study the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by now, you have a lot of different pictures and views are going through your mind as we take the name of Suraqa radiallahu anhu. This is the Sahabi who followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of the Hijrah. And then his horse, the feet of the horse, they sunk in the ground. And that happened to him three times. And finally he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he accepted Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Suraqa, think about a day when you will be wearing the bracelets of Kisra. Now this is a villager. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is leaving Makkah Mukarramah trying to escape with his life. His life is in danger. He has only one person with him to help him. Just one person with him. And he's turning, telling Suraqa in the desert, telling this villager in this situation that he is in, that think about the day when you will be wearing the bracelets, the golden bracelets, the most expensive bracelets in the world. And those will be the bracelets of Kisra, the king of the Persian Empire. From what Suraqa ibn Malik radiallahu anhu had just seen, Allah gave him such a strong iman that he believed in it. Otherwise, any other person would laugh at him. Look at your situation. You have one person only that is helping you right now. You have only one person that is traveling with you. And I'm a villager. He is sitting in the position of being the most powerful man on earth from the worldly point of view. He is the person who's heading the superpower of his time, the Persian Empire. How would I wear? His bracelets. I'm not even allowed to talk to this man. I can't even see him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling him a day will come when these bracelets will be in your hands. Not too long after that. You're talking about how long? Almost about 20 years from this time. 20 years later, during the Khilaf of Umar anhu, they conquered that area. And when the Sahaba that were over there, they collected all the spoils of war and they sent it to Umar anhu. Umar anhu started going through it and he sees those golden bracelets of Kisra. Now wearing gold is haram for men. But he remembers that hadith. So he calls Suraqa in front of all people. And he says, Suraqa, come for me. Yes, Amir al I'm here. What do you need me for? Put your hand out. And he puts his hand out. And Umar radiallahu anhu puts those bracelets in Suraqa's hand. And that is the time when Sahaba saw this. They all had tears in their eyes. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had passed away about 10 years ago. But 20 years back in the desert, he was seeing this day the way we are seeing it today. 20 years back he was seeing it. And he saw these bracelets in Sulaqa's hands. This shows the true Nabuwa that they were seeing signs of prophethood. Who other than a prophet of Allah can say something like this? And in reality speaking, who other than a Sahabi can believe in it in that situation? Muhammad, you know, 
People are willing to kill you. You couldn't even protect yourself in Makkah. You didn't have enough support in Makkah to protect your own life. In your own hometown, you're hiding away from people. You're telling me that she will be taking over the superpowers of the world? That's evil sight. So it really needs this Iman of Sahaba Ridwanullahi to trust these type of statements of Rasulullah Hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma at'amta nafsaka fahuwa laka sadaqa. Whatever you eat is a sadaqa for you, is a charity. Number two, Wa ma at'amta waladaka fahuwa laka sadaqa. Whatever you feed your children is a charity for you. Number three, Wa ma at'amta zawjaka fahuwa laka sadaqa. Whatever you feed your wife is a charity for you. And whatever you feed your servant is a charity for you. Rasulullah is telling us that these are different forms of charity. These are different forms of sadaqat. Sometimes people consider spending money on food to be wastage of money. Of course, we are not talking about being extravagant and just wasting and just buying for show off and then wasting food, eat half a plate and throw the other half in the garbage or eat, eat half an apple and throw the other half in the garbage. We are not talking about wasting money and resources, but things that you eat that you would enjoy eating. This is sadaqah. Without overspending. It's not about, okay, you know, now we heard a hadith that whatever money is spent on the food is sadaqah. Okay, eating from, we're going to the restaurant here. Okay. We have to stay within our boundaries, within our limits. We have to understand that if I can see, you know, sometimes we really need to do this. And we need to all, we all, it's a lesson that we are just learning together. We need to practice this, that we feel like going to the restaurant. If we go to the restaurant, how much are we going to pay? Maybe we'll end up spending $200. How about today we'll eat home and we will give those $200 in charity? We can go. But all of us as a family agree that instead of going to the restaurant and spending $200 over there, how about we spend $150? Okay, we'll eat at home for $50. So we'll spend $150 in charity. This is so that we can control our desire of always eating out. And this is important. It's not about, okay, I can't afford it, so just every day just spending Instead of spending fifty dollars, you're spending two hundred dollars. This is not a good way of living. So we have to stay of within our boundaries, within our limits. Yes, there is time when a person will say, "Okay, let's go out and eat." We'll go out and eat, but generally, whatever is the normal normal method of having preparing the meal at home and having the food ready and everyone really eating, eating together as a family. So. Whatever good items we buy for our families is a sadaqah. There is another problem that we find in this situation. And that is, sometimes people consider spending money on the family to be a burden. But when they go out with friends, then they spend without counting. So with friends, two, three hundred dollars, don't worry about it. That's fine, we're going to do it. But at home, even $50 is too much. This is not true. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that if you feel like eating a good food, you find, you, you buy some good food. You know, sometimes there is certain type of food, it's only, it comes only during certain season. And some, only there is limited time period. And this is why it's very expensive. It's fine. You feel like eating, buy it. Make the intention of sadaqah that this will be a rewarding act for me and I will get the reward of sadaqah. 
If I'm eating it, really I enjoy eating it. My children will enjoy eating it. My family will enjoy eating it. Buy it. Feed them. If you can afford it, let them eat it. It's only a food they will eat. So, this is all considered to be a form of salah. The next chapter is about Man kariha an yatamanna maut al banat This liking to dislike uh, having daughters Uthman ibn Haris radiyallahu anhu rahimahullah narrates on the authority of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu Anna rajulan kana indahu wa lahu banatu fatamanna mautahun A person was sitting by Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu and he had many daughters. So this person wished that his daughters were dead. Difficult financial situation. Or people go through seeing these type of difficulties. Just like in our time also, a person has more children than he or she expected, considers the children to be a burden. Oh, now I have to spend this much on their education. How can, they, how can I afford to send them to the college and then to the university and then marry them? That's a burden. And this is why a lot of people don't like to have more children to maximize life. They don't like to have more than that. Why? It's all because of financial burden. Really, this hadith applies there. That this person wished for his daughters to be dead. فَغَضِبَ ibn Umar, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was very angry to hear that. And he said, أَنْتَ تَرْزُقُهُنَّ Are you their provider? Allah is Razzaq. إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاق Allah is the provider. Do you think you are the provider? In fact, the fact is, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّمَا تُنصَرُونَ وَتُرْزَقُونَ بِضُعَفَائِكُمْ You get your sustenance and you get the nusra and the help of Allah through the weak people amongst you. When you take care of the weak people, Allah helps you also and He opens the doors of risk and help for you. When the person closes that door, Allah makes his life a little difficult for him to live. Most of the people in our time are living with a lot of financial difficulty. Whereas in today's time, most of the people have more money than their forefathers did. They have more money than forefathers did. They have smaller families than their forefathers. But they are in more difficult financial situations than their forefathers. Why? You have more money. You have less responsibilities. Where the burden is coming from? In Allah Huwa Allah is the Razzaq. He gives you a lot when it comes to counting. But when you think about it, you feel, oh, I need much more than this. I need a lot more than this. And this is when the person keeps on going through distress. That nothing is enough for me. I'm working so hard. I've been working for so many years and it's not enough for me. Nothing will be enough for the person if the person is not content with what Allah is giving him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, made a very important point here, and that is, don't think that you are Raza, that you are the provider. Again, sometimes we feel that we are the ones who are doing all of this. If I wasn't there, no one will have food. Oh, my family will start and let this person move out. And the family won't start. This world will continue running the way it's running. And people will survive. And people will get what Allah has assigned for them to get. This is not going to change because of this man living or this man dying. It doesn't really have to change anything. It's only that we are deceived by shaitan, by our, the whispers of our nafs, thinking that I'm the one who's doing it. If it wasn't me, it won't happen. Everything is going to happen, even if you are not there. 
You are not the one who's running this world. You are not the one who is growing the crop in the farms. You are not the one who's creating the fruit on the tree. You are not the one who is digesting the food in people's stomach. Allah is the provider. So having children, having daughters, having many daughters or many children should never be considered a blessing. In fact, the fact is they are always a blessing. They are always a blessing. And through them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens so many doors of health for us that we don't even realize. Don't go by counting the numbers because Allah doesn't go by that. It's not about 5, now 10, now 15, now 20. Allah doesn't go by that. A person who has 100,000 is not enough for him. And there is a person who has only 100, not 100,000, just 100, and he feels I have a lot. Who makes this person feel this way and the other person feel that way? Let's follow Allah subhanahu Inner feelings are in no one's control. In the Allah who was basit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who opens up things and al qabit and he contrasts things. He will control it. He will squeeze resources on you or he will open up resources and will open up the needs also. There are people and I I have seen people like this. Some of you who meet people, who talk to people, you may know people like that. People who have over a million or sometimes millions. They have millions. And they need these many more millions. And they don't find a way of making another two million. But I need the other two million dollars. Because this person who has two million dollars he doesn't want to buy a house that is for 100,000. He wants to buy a house that is worth a million. Then my factory is going to cost me another 3 million. So I'm short of 2 million dollars right now. It's always. Needs will always keep on increasing if a person will just keep on counting numbers. So don't go by numbers. It's the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Children are always a barakah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through them puts a lot of barakah in the family, in the sustenance of the family, in the risk of this, in the family, in the help that this family gets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our children to be a source of khair and rahmah always for us. And give us the tawfiq that we also consider our dependents, be it our children, our families, our brothers and sisters. May Allah give us tawfeed that we also consider them to be a source of rahmah. Spending on others and helping others is always a blessing of Allah. Really. A person who's just me, me, just for me, everything for me, doesn't know what brothers and sisters are going through, but doesn't know what other people are going through. This is not a life. The true humanity is that if I have it, let me see if I can take care of someone. I can share with someone, I can help someone. This is the true humanity. And what can be greater than you have your own children, you have your own brothers and sisters that are in need, and you have close family members that are in need of your support and you help them. This is the true barakah and this is a true khair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened this person's understanding to realize that all of these people are a blessing for me, they're not a burden for me. سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين مولاي صلي وسلم دائما